Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So I-V-D-I, International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash inv, and we'll get you the information that you need. Um, do you recommend staging for all extractions or, or the more extensive work only? Do you set a time limit for time under anesthesia? Um, all good questions. And in our practice, we typically don't. We are doing everything, getting all of that done uh, for that patient. And keep in mind that we're not doing anything else in our practice. We're not having to do spays and neuters and see patients. We see patients in the morning and then we are in surgery the rest of the day until everyone is done. And so in the general practice, we typically recommend no more than three patients a day as far as dentistry goes so that we've got... Um, a, a doable schedule where we're not under the gun and we want to look at those patients and we want to schedule accordingly. We typically don't schedule, you know, three 12 year old Yorkies that have never had any dental care in the same day. That's a, that's a long day. And so one or two perios tops, and then maybe a, you know, four year old, uh, bigger dog or a two-year-old bigger dog for cleaning and assessment, and you will find stuff on the bigger dogs as well. Um, so we want to kind of gauge what patients we're scheduling. But oral surgery, we typically don't stage. Uh, we get them done. Uh, and with uh, you know a time limit, um, we kind of have to look at the patient and we have to look at our oral surgeon. Now, <clears throat> we have cases that are two, two and a half, three hours in some cases, sometimes longer, just depends on what procedure that patient needs. And the skill of the oral surgeon, how quick are they doing extractions? And extractions aren't something to rush through. And uh, the majority of the time that it takes is not necessarily the extraction of the tooth, but debridement and closure of all that infected tissue. So it's really important that we um, take a look at the, the patient, that we're uh, evaluating these, scheduling appropriately. And then if we have issues during surgery that would dictate maybe we need to you know, abort and do something later on, the big thing, blood pressure and uh, body temperature, which we very rarely have issues with. But depending on where you are in the procedure, if we're at the beginning and that temperature is dropped to, you know, 96, 95, and we can't get it up, we're not having an effect, then maybe it's time to recover that patient, have them come back. If we're almost done, we're going to do everything we can to support that patient, monitor closely, and get that procedure done so that we can complete that treatment plan for that patient. So it really depends on what is happening with that patient and um, monitoring and uh, but ideally we would like to complete the treatment plan in one uh, session now your practice certainly can use that uh, as a tool to make your cases go a little bit smoother to take the pressure off your oral surgeon that if it's, you know, full mouth extractions on an advanced periodontal disease dog, there's nothing wrong with doing one side and then having them come back and do the other side. That's perfectly reasonable. So it just depends on what fits with your particular practice. All right. Our next question from Rebecca 
Can dental x-rays be taken with regular x-ray machine or do we need a special machine? Absolutely, very good question. I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, full body x-ray, unfortunately, does not isolate the teeth enough to be diagnostic. Dental x-rays are intraoral where that sensor goes inside the mouth and is positioned in such a way that we can see the teeth uh, without being superimposed on each other. We can see the bone all the way around. We can see from a velar bone to the apex. We can see the periodontal ligament space. We can see the pulp chamber. Full body x-ray, unfortunately, does not give us the diagnostic views that we need in order to make an appropriate, um, correct diagnosis and then the correct treatment plan. So absolutely need um, intraoral dental x-ray. So get with some of your reps to have um, some uh, some of those systems demoed right in your practice and uh, make that a part of your dental program because that, that is absolutely uh, required for uh, veterinary dentistry. Absolutely. Uh, Tammy writes, what dose do you use for butorphanol for dogs that need more sedation? What pre-med protocol do you use for cats? Are you putting your IV catheter in after the pre-med? And do you have an anesthetic and dental chart that you can share? I don't have a chart. Um, I do uh, those calculations very, very quickly. Um, I uh, worked ER for many, many years, and so we had a lot of quickie um, do-in-your-head um, uh calculations that could be done quickly. And um, butorphanol, um, I typically do uh, 0.1 per 10 pounds body weight with their normal dose of 0.1 mg per kg of hydro. As far as our kitties go, we use buprenorphine and midazolam. Buprenorphine at the standard dose, 0.02 mg per kg. Midaz, again, 0.1 mg per kg. Catheter, um, again, I let my patients kind of dictate that. 99.9% .9 of the time, I can go around and throw a tourniquet on and place catheters very easily, very quietly, very calmly, without a whole lot of hullabaloo, without a lot of technicians involved um, to keep that patient as calm as possible. If they won't tolerate that, then yeah, we're going to give that pre-med sub-Q. And a lot of questions about why I give it sub-Q or IV and not IM. The simple answer is IM hurts. And we are totally fear free. We try and be as benign as possible so that these patients uh, are okay coming back. They, they don't flip out. And, and these patients, they remember stuff. They remember. I firmly believe that. So we try and make their visit as quiet, as calm, and as short as possible. Because a lot of these patients, we need to have them come back. And we need to have them come back multiple times. And so <clears throat> that is going to be one of those client compliance um, kind of, you know, components to hopefully um, get those patients to come back and get treated because we need to see them, um, not just one and done, especially those perio patients. Are you only giving the Serenia to cats or dogs as well? That's a question from Emily. And um, yeah, we give it to both species. And again, we're giving that IV and um, we will uh, administer that only through an IV catheter, giving that sub-Q again, uh, that really stings. And so we don't want to do anything that's going to upset these patients and uh, make things uh, more difficult for these patients to, to um, tolerate all of this. Uh, Casey writes, uh, I'm intrigued about maintaining a level of anesthesia where they still have palpebral uh, with extractions or pain painful stimuli? Do you rely on the pre-med and the local block? Again, more uh, more on the regional block. And we typically do not have to increase our isoflurane. Once that block is on board and at full efficacy, typically within five to 10 minutes, uh, we are able to um, maintain these patients, even full mouth extractions on some of our stomatitis cats. By the time we're on that last quadrant, we're down to a half percent 
of isoflurane. Because they're comfortable, because they're relaxed, and uh, they're not feeling anything. So we really can keep them at a very light plane of anesthesia. And we want to back that anesthesia down uh, once we get them induced, once we get those regional blocks on board, and they are uh, comfortable. Um, and we're watching um, our monitors, of course, and then monitoring that palpebral. And as that palpebral becomes uh, more subtle and less pronounced, uh, sometimes we can back them down a little bit. If it goes away, as long as they're breathing okay, we're going to just turn that anesthesia down, see if we can get that to come back. Uh, if they get too deep, uh, we're going to turn that anesthesia off, ventilate with oxygen only, get them to a lighter plane of anesthesia till that palpebral returns, and then continue with our surgery. But we are very, very diligent at keeping them at that, at that level, and uh, good effective regional blocks allow you to do that. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash inv.